Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for calling us into your presence and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the nations, we pray you will hasten the day when swords are beaten into plowshares and justice rolls down like a river. Lord of nature, thank you for the glory that surrounds us, for the beauty of summer, the promise of fall, the, the sleep of winter and rebirth. And Lord of our hearts, we pray that you would give new life in our hearts, that you would mold and shape us so that in the week to come, we may act as agents of your kingdom to bring hope and help and healing. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering today is for the conference ministries. We often take offerings for the world field. Today is one of those where we look to ministering within the Washington Conference. I invite the deacons to stand. Lord, you've given us so much and we with great pleasure give a little back to service those who live in our conference. Bless those ministries as we support them we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad you guys came to church today. It's so nice to see all your faces. It looks like we have a lot more kids this week than last week. Um, I brought some things in this bag today to show you, and all, all these things in this bag are related, and I want to see if you can help me figure out what they are. Let's see if you know what these are. Does anyone know what this is? Any guesses? Does anyone know what that thing is? What is it? Ah, uh, somebody's parents have, <laughs> has taught someone some good work ethic already. So, yeah, this is for something to do with paint. It's a tool, right, for paint. How about this? Does anyone know what this is? Oh, let's see, let's see a hand. Let's see a hand here. Thanks for raising your hand. Duct tape. Oh, duct tape? Yes, yeah, it's, it's some sort of tape, right? Duct tape. It's, it's blue. Does anyone know what kind of tape that is? Duct tape. Not duct tape. There we go. Okay, painter's tape. Are you guys starting to see how things are related here? Okay, some painter's tape. How about this? This is my favorite one, and I know my boys like this one. Look at that thing. Does anyone know what this funny pole is for? What's this? What is this? We forgot. Does anyone know what this thing is? I'll show you in just a second. How about this? Yeah, Nicholas, what is this? Okay, this... Yeah, it looks like a big pencil, huh? I'll show here. This might make it a little easier. Ethan, can you hold my mic? Let me hold it. There we go. There we go. This is what it's for. Ah. Oh. Okay, now can you see what this is? What is this? A paint roller. Ah, paint roller. Good job. Okay, so what you do is we take the roller brush and put it on the end there. Put it on the end, and then you can paint with it. Can you hold my mic again? And the best part is that it gets really long and you can reach way up to the top of walls. Well, we just bought, we just bought a house, our first house, and we're trying to fix it up. And I like painting a lot because you can take something with paint, you can take something that looks old, maybe walls that are scratched or they've, they've been there for a long time and you can cover them up and make them look new again. And also, I like the smell of new paint. It just smells fresh and it takes away any old smells. Well. I have some, some other pic some pictures to show you guys of paint, and another reason why I like painting um, is because you can take things that are old and make them new again. So here's some examples of old things that look new again. So for example, I have two houses there. On the top you see a house that's just kind of plain and old, but on the top, once they repainted it, it looks, brand it looks like a brand new house, right? Well, another thing about paint is you can take old crumbling homes like this old barn here. See the old paint, it's peeling off. Well, they repainted it and it looks new again, right? So that's the cool thing about paint. Also, you can make something look more exciting too. For example, we had a doctor's office here. Before the doctor's office was just plain white walls and then when they repainted it, what do you guys see on the walls there now? What do you see on the walls? Patterns, right? So they have leaves they painted on the walls. Isn't that a lot more exciting? Yeah. Well, did you know that the Bible tells us, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says that anyone who belongs to Jesus Christ, belongs to Jesus Christ, becomes a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So Jesus is kind of like paint, right? What do you think? Is Jesus like paint? Yeah? Are we perfect people? No. no. Sometimes we do things maybe that aren't right, or maybe we've sinned because nobody's perfect. But having Jesus is like putting paint on us. He covers us up, and he makes us brand new again. Maybe we're old now, but when we have Jesus, and when we go to heaven, we're going to be new, brand new again. We're going to be like brand new people. So that's the neat thing about Jesus. Jesus is like paint. Can you guys say, Jesus is like paint? Yeah, he makes us new again. Okay, don't forget that. Thank you for being such good listeners. And we're going to get our buckets and take those back to the back. Thank you.
Gracious Father, we are thankful that we can come this morning into this beautiful sanctuary to worship you and experience the peace of heart and mind that only you can impart. We're here with high expectations. We're uplifted as the choir sings and as we join them in hymns of praise. And we're confident that we'll leave the building with the confidence that we'll experience your leading in the decisions, some difficult and some experiences which may be vexing that we'll face in the week ahead. We lift up every person in this congregation who's facing a difficult choice where there seems to be no good option. Give them clarity so they can make a choice and feel a measure of peace about it. Lord, we'd like to disengage from the troubles of the world just for this one hour, but we can't and we dare not try because as a nation, we're living in exceptionally unusual times. There are degrees of chaos in many places. Lord, you're infinitely eager to lead us so we can fill our destiny. So please, Lord, Keep speaking to the hearts of our leaders in the hope that they'll listen and respond and follow the path to order and progress for all. Be with our pastor as he speaks and points us in a path to avoid the folly of trying to get even with those that would hurt and harm us. And our prayers go to those who are worshipping with us through television. Bless their participation in this worship hour, we pray in their homes and surround them with the sense of your presence. And for those in our congregation who are ill and experiencing pain, we pray they'll find courage to hold on despite the pain, despite the limitations that illness places on our daily lives. These blessings and these mercies we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Testament reading is taken from Micah 7, 18 to 20. Where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised our ancestors to Abraham and Jacob.
Our New Testament reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. Then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. Wednesday night, or was it Thursday night? I was in a meeting here at the church, and there was an argument. Now, don't tense up. This was kind of an amusing argument. I've actually heard this argument in this setting before. This was a meeting of the Green Lake Foundation, one of the ministries birthed by this church. And in the meeting, two men got into an argument. And the argument about was, who had done the most work? And this argument was the reverse of the way it would commonly be, quote, out there. He did the most work. No, he did the most work. No, 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 no. He did the, well, but I wouldn't have been able to do anything. Well, but I, finally, somebody who works as much as both of them said, you guys just knock it off. When I sit, engage with conversation with people in this congregation, very, very frequently, I am blown away with the amount of service that is, that is just assumed as being natural. From some distance, if we were buried in the typical American dream of making it myself. This might look strange, but when you step into this community, service is, is natural. It's expected. It's what people do. And if they don't do it, they talk about doing it. And if they didn't do it, they say, well, but I wish I had. Because service is just... It's who we are. I saw a post on Facebook this week. Andrew Gashu, who we deeply lament, has grown up and is no longer here every week because he's off doing great and wonderful things. And so the picture is he's sitting in some coffee shop. I think it's in the Bay Area. I meant to ask Alex or Helen 
Where is this place? Muddy Waters Cafe. It's not the Bay Area, it's Vermont, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a picture of a coffee shop, and, and Andrew is there, and he's playing his cello in a string quartet in this coffee shop, and you can see the doors are open, you see the sidewalk out there. And Andrew's label for his picture is playing Sibelius in a coffee shop, period. Because why not? And if you knew Andrew, if you know Andrew, you're going, well, yeah, give him a chance to play. He's going to play. That's what he does. He's a musician. And if there's a coffee shop with space, why not? Right? And whether you play the banjo or the cello or the harmonica, <laughs> what do musicians do? They make music. What do Christians do? They serve. It's natural. We do it. And when we don't do it, we talk about it. And when we can't do it, we wish we could. It is, it's natural. Our scripture reading, our New Testament scripture reading, Matthew chapter 5. I like to think of the Sermon on the Mount, this section of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. It lays out the principles of what it, if you are a Jesus follower, this is what you do. This is what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. And after some opening principles, some statements of principles, finally down about, what was it, verse 24, um, Jesus begins to say, okay, so this, this, do this, do this, do this. And the first one, he says, you have heard it said, you know, back in, back in the day, it was said, do not murder. There's this crowd of people listening, and they're going, yeah, duh, yeah. And for a minute, as I was working on my sermon, I changed Jesus into a, a black preacher, or at least a Southern Baptist preacher. I imagine Jesus doing this. You've heard that it was said, the old folks were told, don't murder, right? Yeah. Don't murder, right? Is that it? Come on. They don't, don't, you know, playing the, come on, you got, this, this is not controversial, folks. I'm not setting you up. We're not supposed to murder, right? And fine, oh, yeah, oh, wonderful. You guys are good. Okay, so everybody says, right? And Jesus says, oh, phew. Uh, you had me worried there. So we start from this bedrock that, Jesus and the crowd of thousands agree on. But we can go beyond that. The bedrock that Jesus is laying here is a conviction. It is not a uniquely Christian conviction. This is a human conviction. I don't know of any human society anywhere where murder is not regarded as evil. Murder is bad. That's what it, you're not human if you don't agree with that. Or if you're human, you, you're, you're, you're a profoundly broken human. You are so abnormal that we need to put you away. Because murder's not allowed. Not in communist China. Not in liberal Sweden. Not in chaotic Somalia. Not here in the U.S. Murder is bad. And Jesus' crowd goes, yep, you're right. Murder is bad. We got it. You can move on, Jesus. We got that. Murder is bad. So what does it mean to murder? To take life away. Certainly we can do that with a sword, 
a pipe wrench, a gun. There's lots of ways to physically murder people, but we all know that when you talk about taking life away, you can take life away from someone and still leave them breathing and still have their heart beating, but something inside has died. And then Jesus goes straight to the place where most humans begin their taking life away, and that is with words. He said, you have heard, don't murder. Oops, <laughs> don't fall off the stage. Um, they go, yes. And Jesus says, but listen, yeah, put your swords away. Put your bludgeons away. Watch your tongue. In the King James, it says, if you call your brother a fool, you stand in danger of damnation. The New Living Translation updates it. If you call your brother, I wish they hadn't put this in. If you call your brother an idiot. That strikes pretty close home. Don't murder, not even with words. When I posted a first take at a summary of the sermon on Facebook, somebody responded, and I told him I'm going to quote him, Stephen Brothers, never met him, I've seen him on Facebook. I said that Jesus warns us against obliterating people with our words. And he responded and said, yeah, I've noticed how on social media, how often when we describe a position we don't like, we talk about that position being obliterated. And then he went on to say all the other things that he had seen. That person has been exploded, they have been axed, they have been, and he had a list of 20 words that are all synonyms of destroy. And in today's world, it's fairly common for us to speak of our ideological enemies using words that mean to destroy them. We don't simply say, I disagree. We say way more than that. We say, you're an idiot. And Jesus said, that's a damnable offense. Don't do it. Ouch. (laughs) That, that, That steps on our toes. Because the reason we say that is because they are idiots, right? Don't say it. Jesus, at this point, pivots. I'm fascinated by the rhetorical pivot that happens now. Don't murder. Don't obliterate, even with words. Then Jesus turns, and he says, if your brother has something against you, and let's... uh, brother or sister, (laughs) if somebody, if another human being has something against you and you show up in church and you get ready to open your hymnal and sing, blessed be the tie that binds, and you remember there is somebody who wants to obliterate you, he says, "Eh, just close the hymnal, put it back in the shelf, and go seek reconciliation. What good is it to sing to God when we are wishing to obliterate human beings? At that point, worship becomes a Band-Aid on a cancer. It is not a cure. It is not a treatment. It would be like painting rotten wood. 
I'm painting my house right now, and yeah, Brian is right. You know, he, he, this wall that it, man, it faded and it peeled and it was looking pretty ugly. It, boy, you scrape it and you put some paint on there and you go, wow, yeah, that's beautiful. But you scrape it first. And if there's rotten wood, oh, heaven help us, now you got work to do. Worship. when it is used as a substitute for pursuing reconciliation. Worship is a bad thing because it keeps us from doing the healing thing, which is what Jesus calls us to. But notice what Jesus has done here. He started out, don't murder, not even with words. And so I'm sitting here thinking about all those jerks that I can't call jerks anymore. And all those idiots, I can't call idiots anymore. And I'm still thinking about how idiotic they are. And then Jesus flips it and he says, if somebody has something against you, go seek reconciliation. All of a sudden, instead of pushing back against murder, Jesus has called us to nourish life. which is the service thing that I talked about earlier. Why do people serve? Because that human needs something and I can make the universe a happier place by, by providing that bit of service. We nourish life instead of fighting evil. Why do people commit murder? If I'm going to murder somebody, I do it because they're bad. They are a bad person and they have wounded me. Why do I nourish life? Because that's who we are. And all of a sudden, we can operate from who we are instead of who they are. In my head, I thought about getting even. Uh, I did a terrible thing. As I was working for this sermon, I Googled getting even. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, man. I, I only looked at, I think, one, one website, getting even with your ex. And um, you know, the, at the top it said, uh, before you read this list, just remember that... Um, Spending a few years in jail might be worse than not getting even. You know, and then it, then it gave 10 or 15 ways to get even with your ex, some of which are clearly illegal. Getting even is a march toward death. Someone has done wrong. They have done wrong to me. To get even with them, I need to stoop to their level. And notice that word stoop. I am going down to where they are. And so then when they respond to me and they go lower, and then I go low, getting even is a race to death. And in the moment, it might, might seem like a good thing, but it's a race toward death. Jesus calls us away from the race toward death and, and beckons us to the cultivation of life. That's why we serve. We we seek to do good because that's how you, well, first, that's who we are, and that's how, you, that's how you build the kingdom, and we are part of the kingdom of God. And, and when we get together, it is natural for us to talk about the good that we wished we had done and the good we hope to do and something that I think we need to learn to do, which for most Christians is prohibited, we even need to celebrate the good we have done. 
Sure, there's a danger of somebody going, oh, look at me, I'm so good. But the reality is that those things which are not celebrated tend to get forgotten. And we should celebrate the goodness that we get to participate in. Um, just before the foundation meeting on Wednesday night, I had a little bit of time. I thought, oh, I can go run around the lake. Need to get some cobwebs out of my head. And I've got just enough time to get around the lake, get back, get a shower, and be in the meeting on time, I thought. So I head out the door, start running around the lake. And I hadn't gone very far. And I see this couple coming toward me. And their face looked vaguely familiar. And then I can see they're looking at me. Uh-oh, I'm so sorry. And we get closer. Oh, yes. These are, it's Matt and Betsy. They're runners. So I stop running so I can talk to the runners. They were walking. Now, and what did we talk about? Matt, he, he, he says, oh, I can, oh, you're, you're looking good. Looks like you've been running a lot lately. The ultimate compliment in the running community is to tell somebody they've been running. Uh, and we started, and you gotta understand where this is coming from. Now, if this had been just anybody saying that, I'd have gone, yeah, whatever. But if Matt says you're a runner, it's like if Ken tells me I did a good sermon. You know, he doesn't say that very often. You go, whoa, you yeah. know. Matt ran the Bigfoot 120. That's a 120-mile race from Mount Adams to Mount St. Helens last fall. Um, this guy regularly, every year, runs two or three hundred-mile races. So if he says, you look like you've been running, I'm going, Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then I, I asked about Betsy's running, ah, and her face fell for a minute. She said, you know, I was going to do the Bigfoot 100-kilometer race this weekend, this weekend while we're sitting here. I had signed up for it, but then I realized I wasn't ready, and so I've, I, I've decided not to run it, from. But what we've done is Matt and I have volunteered to do one of their aid stations, which is really remote. You have to hike seven miles from nearest road to get to this place where we're going to do the aid station. And we've got to backpack all the stuff in and filter water from streams. And we're going to run this aid station in the back country out there in the woods somewhere so that the people who are running the race can, can keep going. And, you know, we're chit-chatting, and then we talked about trails around here we want to run, and that's what runners do. They run. They talk about running, and when they can't run, well, they talk about what they would like to do, and if you still can't run, you figure out a way to help somebody else run. As Christians, as the followers of Jesus, We aim to use all our powers to nourish life and goodness, beginning with words. We talk together about our ambitions to serve. And when we can't, eh, I, I wish I could have. And if we still can't, we figure out some way to help somebody else serve. Because it's who we are, it's what we do, because we are the people of Jesus.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.